Looking for a healthy new way to feed your family without the hassle and hype? Welcome to Liz's Healthy Table, where your host, registered dietitian nutritionist Liz Weiss, serves up fresh and flavorful recipes with a tasty side of science, good nutrition, and fun. Are you and your family ready for some wholesome food that tastes great too? Don't change that dial. Your food adventure starts here. Sandor, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. So I have been reading through your book, and as my listeners know, I'm very obsessed with kombucha, and so I know we're going to get into that during the podcast, but I just want to hear a little bit about your background. You've been called the Johnny Appleseed of Fermentation by Michael Pollan, an unlikely rock star of the American food scene by the New York Times. So tell everybody how you became the king of fermentation. Well, I certainly have no formal background in culinary arts or food science or microbiology or any related topic. But like most individuals in most parts of the world, I grew up enjoying flavors of fermentation. And as it happened, as a kid growing up in New York City, pickles were among my favorite (laughs) foods. And so I was just predisposed to this flavor of fermentation, although nobody in my family was making the pickles. We were buying them at a local delicatessen. When I was in my mid-20s, I followed a macrobiotic diet for a couple of years, and macrobiotics really emphasizes the digestive benefit of pickles and other kinds of fermented foods. And I started observing that these pickles that I had loved to eat my entire life, when I ate them, I could literally feel saliva squirting out under my tongue. So in a very literal sense, I began to associate these foods with getting my digestive juices flowing. But what really got me playing around with fermentation in my kitchen is that I moved from New York City to rural Tennessee about 25 years ago, and I started gardening. And I was such a naive city kid that it was a little bit of a surprise that in a garden, all of the cabbage is ready at about the same time. (laughs) All of the radishes are ready at about the same time. So Suddenly, this practical aspect of fermentation, you know, and its ability to effectively preserve food became relevant to my life. And, you know, that's when I made my first batch of sauerkraut, started experimenting more broadly and really just became obsessed with all things fermented. So apologies, everybody. Didn't take my phone off the hook. So I'm going to hold it in my hand now. And if it rings again, I promise to turn it right up. You know, when you talk about pickles, Sandor, I think of the movie Crossing Delancey Street. And you could shop on the street at the local deli and get pickles out of the barrel. And I think those pickles are different than what you would get at the grocery store, let's say that might be refrigerated or something that's in a jar. Isn't that true? Well, I mean, the big difference is that the vast majority of pickles that are available in contemporary supermarkets basically are a hot vinegar solution poured over vegetables, whereas the pickles I grew up with, most of the traditional pickles around the world are basically vegetables that have been in a saltwater solution, a brine. And in that briny environment, lactic acid bacteria can thrive and they produce lactic acid, which preserves the vegetables which is a different flavor, a different process, a different compound than the vinegar with acetic acid, which is commonly added to vegetables for contemporary pickles. You know, the great advantage of vinegar pickles, especially if you use a hot solution and you heat process them, is that they can sit indefinitely on a store. So that's wonderful and easy for commerce. The other kinds of pickles, the more traditional pickles, you know, they're more dynamic. They're alive. They can't just sort of sit sealed in a jar, ambient temperatures. Once you seal them in a jar, they really need to go in the refrigerator. Otherwise, you'll end up with juice seeping out of the jar or possibly jars exploding. But You know, I would say that the traditional lactic acid pickles are much more delicious to my palate. They're much healthier because they're probiotic. And, you know, really the only advantage of vinegar pickling is for uh, commerce and shelf stability, but it comes at the cost of flavor and health benefits. So let's back up then and let's just give everybody a little primer. What exactly are fermented foods? What are they? And just give us a little shopping list. Well, sure. You know, almost everybody eats and drinks products of fermentation every day. Some, you know, sort of common everyday products of fermentation in a standard American diet would be coffee, 
bread, cheese, cured meats, condiments, chocolate, vanilla, sauerkraut, kimchi, beer, wine. What unites all of these disparate foods is that they are created by the action of microorganisms. You know, bacteria and or fungi, you know, transform the foods. And, you know, rather than decomposing the foods, which is what people, you know, sort of typically associate with microbial transformation of food, you know, in fermentation, really, we're always elevating the food, we're improving the food, there's always some practical benefit to fermentation. Instead of the food decomposing, you know, we get food that is more stable for uh, storage, we get food that is more delicious. We get food that is more easily digestible. So, you know, there's always a practical benefit of fermentation. And, you know, our world is full of fermented delicacies. I mean, really what we have in gourmet stores are products of fermentation. I mean, that's mostly what we elevate on this pedestal. Yeah. So if you're eating cheese, let's say, because that's a fermented food, but it's in the refrigerator, are you still consuming bacteria or did the bacteria do their work and now they're kind of sleeping? Because it's in the fridge. Well, I mean, even when bacteria are sleeping, they're still there. <laughs> okay. And, you know, your intestine is not as cold as your refrigerator. So, yeah, sure, they'll go into a state of dormancy when they exhaust their nutrients, when they're in a cooler temperature. But, you know, that's not the same as being dead. You know, they can come back to life given the presence of appropriate nutrition, given a temperature range in which they can function. So, yeah, I mean, your typical cheese has bacteria in it. And yogurt, too, right? Yogurt, and that's could the be biggie. thought of as probiotic. Sure. I mean, yogurt, kefir, I mean, all kinds of foods and beverages. So people should not be afraid of bacteria. I mean, we live in this germ-obsessed society. I know when my boys were younger, I was always like, wash your hands. And, you know, we have to realize that when we eat fermented foods, they're for a reason. They, as you said, took that food to a new level, but they're also good for us. Talk a little bit about the health benefits of these good bacteria. Well, let me talk a little bit about, you know, the war on bacteria and this sort of, you know, indoctrination that we all receive that bacteria are so dangerous and need to be avoided. And I think it's great that you encouraged your kids to wash their hands. I mean, I think that hygiene is very important, but we live in a bacterial world. You know, in our human bodies, our bodily cells are outnumbered something like 10 to 1 by bacteria that we're host to. And, you know, far from being parasites or freeloaders, these bacteria actually give us, you know, much of our functionality because of bacteria in our intestines that we're able to effectively digest food and assimilate nutrients from our food. What we call our immune system is mostly the work of bacteria. There have been, you know, amazing, you know, new findings over the last couple of years demonstrating that serotonin and other chemical compounds that determine our brain function, our neurological function, how we feel, how we think, are regulated by bacteria in our intestines. I mean, for that matter, you know, the emerging consensus in the field of evolutionary biology is that all life has descended from bacteria. And the corollary to this is no life has ever lived without bacteria. So, you know, just as we are dependent on bacteria to be able to digest food and assimilate nutrients, so too the carrot or the cabbage or other vegetables are dependent on bacteria to uptake nutrients from the soil. And then each vegetable has its own microbiome. And, you know, we're working with that when we ferment it. We're sort of trying to guide the microbial development. Now, you know, because of this war on bacteria thinking, which isn't just wash your hands, but it's use all of these chemical products, use this, you know, antibacterial cleansing product because it promises to kill 99.9% .9 of bacteria. You know, oh, you're feeling a little sniffly, take this antibiotic drug. You know, we're all exposed to these chemicals designed to kill bacteria all the time. And it has the effect of diminishing biodiversity in our gut. When we take probiotic capsules or when we eat living fermented foods, I say living fermented foods because you can cook fermented foods and kill all those bacteria. You can heat process sauerkraut and kill all those bacteria. But when you eat uncooked and unheat processed fermented foods, you're ingesting these broad communities of bacteria. And, you know, really the greatest benefit that they have for us is that they help to restore biodiversity in the gut. 
which can help us, you know, in myriad different ways because our body needs bacteria for so many different functions. You know, and what's really interesting too, and I'm sure you talk to folks about this when you do your classes, is that when you eat a diet rich in fiber, so fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and seeds, that fiber is food for the bacteria that live in your gut. So there's a lot of great reasons why we should not only eat fermented foods, fermented vegetables, but eat the vegetables themselves. It's a really beautiful cycle, right? Yeah, sure. And I mean, these fibers are often known as prebiotics, you know, and Mm -hmm. the companions to probiotics, because although they're not bacteria themselves, they are such effective food for bacteria and for the bacteria in residence along the entire length of the digestive tract. When we just eat sort of processed, easy to digest foods, you know, we are failing to adequately feed the bacteria all the way along our digestive tract. And this is also part of the diminished biodiversity that most of us experience. Right, right. And oh, before I forget coffee. If I'm drinking coffee in the morning, because you said coffee is a fermented food, yeah. am I consuming good bacteria when I'm drinking that coffee? No, no, no. no. Yeah, I mean, it's been roasted right. and then okay. you poured boiling water over it. So no, I mean, and same thing when you eat bread. If you want to eat raw sourdough dough, that's teeming with bacteria. But who wants to eat raw dough? <laughs> right. You know, the bread. Only if it's raw cookie dough. dough. Although you probably shouldn't eat that either. In the hot oven, the dough cooks and the bacteria perish. So, you know, at least, you know, you need to be savvy and thinking about this in terms of, you know, which foods actually, you know, can contain living bacteria. Certainly, if you want to eat a cacao fruit raw or eat raw coffee berries or especially after their brief fermentation, those will be teeming with bacteria. That's not your cup of coffee. (laughs) Exactly. So Deanna, who's one of my podcast posse Facebook friends... I always ask my folks online, do you have any questions for my guest? And Deanna, who's a friend and a listener, she says she wants to know how often she should be eating fermented foods. And is there like a certain amount to reap the benefits? Can you quantify it at all? Well, I mean, I would just say every day, you know, the more frequently, the better. You know, I would say in terms of amounts, Small amounts are adequate. I mean, these are strong flavors. In certain cases, they can be very salty. You know, they're really condiments. They're foods that have always been eaten in relatively small quantities, but regularly. You know, your average Korean person is eating kimchi three times a day with every meal. It doesn't mean they're eating massive amounts of kimchi. Generally, it's a relatively small proportion of the meal, but they're eating it with great regularity. And that's what I would recommend to anybody. I mean, not that you have to eat it at every meal, but I would say, you know, if you incorporate a little bit of sauerkraut or a little bit of yogurt, you know, at least once a day in whatever you're eating, that's a great way to sort of get these probiotic benefits. Great, great. Well, I know personally, I love yogurt. I love kefir, kefir. And I am completely obsessed with kombucha. So kombucha is a fermented tea. The flavor that I love is sort of this fruity flavor, kind of like a cranberry-ish flavor. And there's very little sugar in it. So it's just, it's fizzy. There's something about kombucha that it's just bizarre, but I literally crave it. Can you tell everybody what is kombucha? It's a little pricey. So, you know, is it easy to make at home? Can anybody, I know in your book, you've got in uh, Wild Fermentation, you've got lots of recipes in the book, including how to make kombucha, but give us kind of the one-on-one on kombucha. Well, kombucha is really very simple to make. All you do is you brew tea. It could be a strong brew, a, a weak brew. It could be black tea. It could be green tea. You add some sugar to it. You could make it very sweet if that's what you like. You could make it barely sweet if that's your preference. The trick is you need the mother of kombucha which looks like a rubbery pancake and it floats on top of your fermenting sweet tea. And in that mother of kombucha reside the actual bacteria and yeast that ferment the tea into kombucha. Then I do it in an open vessel. You need some oxygen, so you need airflow. You can't cut it off from the airflow. And then, you know, the amount of time that it will take will depend a little bit on temperature. The faster it is, the warmer it is, the faster the metabolism of these fermenting organisms, the cooler it is, the slower they are. 
Kombucha typically likes a warm environment, let's say above 72 degrees, 75 is kind of ideal. But, you know, it'll get progressively more sour as the sugars ferment into acids. If you let it go all the way, it'll turn into something like vinegar, and most people won't enjoy drinking it. So most people drink their kombucha somewhere after 7 to 10 days, depending on their preference, depending on temperature. When some of the sugars have converted into acids and it tastes pleasantly tart while still being pleasantly sweet. Kombucha is wonderful. Kombucha is an example of a broad group of ferments that I would describe generically as lightly fermented beverages you know, to distinguish them from alcoholic beverages. But some other examples would be a wonderful bittersweet Caribbean beverage that's called Mobi, a Mexican beverage that's called Tepache, a Russian beverage that's called Kvass. You know, there are many, many variations on this idea of lightly fermented beverages, and kombucha is one of them. And kombucha has become very, very popular. You know, when I first learned about kombucha, which would be mm, close to 25 years ago, it just didn't exist commercially. And where is it hail from, Sander? What part of the world is kombucha? Is it Asian, uh, Japanese? It's it's Asian. Um, uh, It's generally regarded to be from the north of China. Okay. It's been popular outside of Asia for a good long time. I know in Russia, going back to the beginning of the 20th century, it's been very popular. But it seems like its popularity in the U.S. began in the mid-90s and has grown steadily ever Hmm. since. Hey, where do you get the mother if you want to kind of start making it yourself? Well, that's the tricky part. If you go to the store and you buy a little bit of living kombucha, the plainer the flavor, the better, and you just leave it in a bowl exposed to air, it will generally form a mother from the organisms that are in the liquid. You know, otherwise, if you look in my books or my website, I list sources of them. I mean, literally, you could just type into the search bar, where can I get a kombucha Hmm. mother? And they'll just pop up. I mean, people are selling them on eBay and on Craigslist and on Amazon and, you know, everywhere you could possibly buy something online you could buy kombucha mothers. This is good to know. Or you go to Brooklyn, New York. Everyone's a hipster there and they're all making kombucha. So that's another thing you could do, right? Well, you really don't have to go to Brooklyn, New York. I'm teasing. Although that would be fun. There are these online trading posts. I have links to them on my websites and them in my books, but they're all organized geographically. So, you know, let's say you live in Arkansas. You know, you could look up Arkansas and then look up your mm-hmm. town and maybe a neighbor of yours would have it or maybe someone in a town 10 minutes over. But they're easy to find because of the popularity of kombucha. Hey, what's growing in your garden right now? And what are you doing with it? You know, are you making sauerkraut? Like what's happening? Because it's like, I know here in New England, let's see, we're recording the show in early October. It's going to be mid-October. You know, we're sort of entering pumpkin and squash season here. So what's happening in your neck of the woods? Well, I mean, this is such an exciting time of the year in the garden because we still have the late summer things. I'm still eating tomatoes and basil. I've got gorgeous, gorgeous winter squash. And then I have all these sort of fresh fall greens coming up and radishes. Like my Mm. favorite thing that I grow in the winter, in the fall that I love to ferment is radishes. And I have daikon radishes. I have these watermelon radishes that are pink on the inside and then have a green skin. I have black Spanish radishes. Radishes all ferment beautifully well. Cabbages all ferment beautifully well. I mean, this really is the time of year that is perfectly suited to fermentation. And, you know, traditionally in most temperate places, you know, it's in that fall harvest season that you would put up large amounts of sauerkraut to get you through the winter. A lot of people today don't realize what an important survival food sauerkraut has been historically. So, you know, in the absence of a supermarket that you can go to any time and buy, you know, vegetables from anywhere in the world, you know, people historically have had to make do with, you know, what grows in their area. And in many temperate regions, you know, that growing period ends sometime around now, you know, um, it's late September, October into November. And there's, you know, some period of the year where there is no fresh plant food. And so the way people have had plant food to 
to eat in the winter to prevent having scurvy and you know other kinds of nutritional deficiency diseases which could occur in the absence of plant food for weeks or months you know sauerkraut pickles kimchi you know these really are survival strategies and this is the time of the year to make large batches that you can put up and eat for months and i'm planning to go to my friend's farm about an hour from here and fill up a pickup truck with daikon radishes in a few weeks. And I have a 55 gallon vessel that I will fill with daikon radishes and I'll be eating those and sharing those with my friends through the winter. Fantastic. So let's say like right now I went to Wilson Farms yesterday. It's a beautiful farm in my neighborhood. It's been here well over 100 years. It's just such a gift to have it walking distance from my house. And I bought some beautiful radishes. So let's say I've got radishes, carrots and cabbage, and I want to make sauerkraut. And I'm just a newbie at this. It sounds like it's kind of easy. Like I know I've got a big mason jar. So like, what do I do next? What do I do with these fresh ingredients? How do I create that sauerkraut? So the sauerkraut method would generically be described as the dry salting method. So typically you don't add any water. You salt, you shred the vegetables to create surface area. You salt the vegetables and then the salt begins to pull water out of the vegetables and they get nice and juicy so that when you fill your jar or crock or whatever your vessel is, you know, when you press down, it forces the juice of the vegetables up so that you can get the vegetables submerged protecting them from oxygen and creating an ideal environment for the lactic acid bacteria to flourish. So really all you do is shred the vegetables. You can do that with a knife. You can do that with a hand grater. You can do that with a food processor, but you just shred the vegetables to create surface area. You can do it coarsely. You can do it finely. The finer you go, the easier it is for the juice to get out of the vegetable but you could do coarser pieces too. So you shred, then you salt. There's no magic number like any other recipe in the joy of cooking. Salt to taste. Don't be afraid of that. You know, what I like to do is lightly salt as I'm shredding, mix everything up, and then just taste it and just let taste be my guide. Add a little bit more salt if necessary. It's always easier to add salt than it is to subtract salt. Then what I like to do is just get in there with my hands and squeeze the vegetables. As I'm sort of mixing them and tossing them, I'll squeeze with some force. And really what you're trying to do is uh, break down cell walls to further release juices. Once they're nice and juicy and I can pick up a little handful and squeeze it and it's like a wet sponge, then I know there's plenty of juice and I can get the vegetables submerged. A jar is perfect. A quart size jar will take approximately two pounds of vegetables to fill. A wide mouth jar is the easiest to work with, but you can work with whatever kind of jar you have. You know, so Ceramic crocks are also wonderful. Wooden barrels work great. Plastic buckets are functional. What you want to avoid is metal. Don't ferment vegetables in a metallic vessel because the salt can corrode the metal and the acids can corrode metal. Once you get your vegetables submerged in a jar, what I usually do is I put the top on, but don't put it in the closet because it's alive and it's going to be sort of creating carbon dioxide and pressure. And if it's in a jar, you really need to off gas it. So I like to leave it right on the kitchen counter. And then the next morning when I'm making my coffee or whatever, I like to loosen the lid to let the pressure that's built up overnight out. While I'm at it, I like to just press down and make sure all the vegetables get submerged again because the carbon dioxide can lift them up and then continue. And really after about a week, most of the vigorous carbon dioxide production is done and it will go much more slowly after that. But of course, the million dollar question in fermentation is, is how long do you ferment it for and how do you know when it's done? And there's no straightforward objective answer to that question. The acids accumulate over time. You know, if you were making this in, you know, 19th century Russia, you know, you would just keep it in your cellar and eat it as it got progressively more sour as the weeks and months passed. If it's on your kitchen counter, what I would recommend doing is giving it at least three or four days and then having a tiny little taste and then packing it down and letting it continue. Then three or four days later, have another taste and you'll notice that it has a stronger flavor. 
if you taste it at regular intervals, then you can familiarize yourself with the spectrum of flavors that are possible. And if one day you should taste it and think to yourself like, wow, this is getting strong. I don't think I want this to get any stronger than this. Well, that's the point at which you move it into your refrigerator, your fermentation slowing device. So the process is easy. You can do it with literally any kind of vegetable that you have or that you like. You can season it in lots of different ways. You could make it salty or not salty as you prefer. You can ferment it for just a few days, a few weeks, a few months as you prefer. This is an extremely versatile process that can be varied and you know produce beautiful fermented vegetables in lots and lots of different ways. So once it goes in the fridge, again, the bacteria kind of go to sleep, but you still reap the benefits. But if you ate it just sort of right off your, out of the counter, out of the container that's on your counter, it'll be a little more robust, I would say, right, in terms of the bacteria? Putting bacteria in the refrigerator, I mean, it slows them down because of the temperature. I don't really think you can generalize that out of the fridge is nutritionally superior to in the fridge. Okay, good. Good to know. So this is a weird question, but I met the Sonnenberg husband and wife researcher team at Stanford. They do a lot on the microbiome and I interviewed them for- Right, they have a great book. The Good Gut. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah, they're fantastic. And it's just so fascinating. And when I interviewed them for a podcast I used to have called Cooking with the Moms, that's off the air. And now we're on to this new podcast. But they had talked a lot about how they changed their lifestyle and their diet. And they were able to actually map out their microbiome by sending in a stool sample to the American Gut Project. And they could see their diversity and the community really growing in their gut. And have you ever done that? Have you ever kind of mapped out, had your, your microbiome mapped out? Yeah, sure. No, I'm, I submitted uh, specimens to the American Gut Project for sure. So sure, I have, I have a little poster visual representation. Yeah, I mean, it, it's very interesting. I mean, I'm not sure that I have the, you know, sort of conceptual framework to fully understand what it's telling me, but then I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure it does. No. And I think that for researchers, the, the greatest interest is, you know, sort of seeing the variety that exists and what kinds of variables might, you know, impact upon the communities that we're finding. Right. One of their big things is eating a fiber-rich diet to feed the bacteria that you have in your gut. So there's a lot going on here and there's so many health benefits. So I absolutely encourage everybody to start thinking about incorporating more fermented foods into the diet. I mean, you could take something like kefir. I call it kefir. You call it kefir? Am I saying it wrong? Kefir? And you could make smoothies with it. You could just drink it. My boys love it. And it's just kind of slightly sour. It's like a yogurt beverage, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yogurt is one style of fermented milk, but I think it's really important to recognize that the fresh milk that we grew up with, you know, is really a phenomenon of the 20th century, because how do you have fresh milk if you don't have a refrigerator? I mean, sure, people milking goats and cows have always had access to fresh milk, but down the supply chain, what people have had access to is sour milk. And yogurt is one example of sour milk. It's the one that's become the most famous around the world. But in every part of the world where people domesticated animals for their milk, they developed distinctive styles of fermented milk. And around the world, there are hundreds of different styles of fermented milk. Yogurt is one of them. Kefir is a different one. It's made in a very different process from yogurt rather than just using the previous batch to introduce the starter into the next batch as we do with yogurt. Kefir is made with a SCOBY, a symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast, analogous to the mother of kombucha, except they're called kefir grains. And kefir grains look completely different. They look like little florets of cauliflower. They come from the Caucasus Mountains in Central Asia. And you plop these little rubbery masses into milk and the extremely elaborate community of organisms, more than 30 distinct organisms which have been identified, they all grow into the milk. So true kefir is just you know, very, very powerfully probiotic. Nothing that's commercially available in the United States is true kefir. Because among the 30-odd organisms on kefir grains is yeast. 
And so yeast takes a little bit of that lactose, the milk sugar, and turns it into alcohol. So kefir will typically have around a half a percent alcohol, which in our regulatory system creates problems because anything with more than 0.5% alcohol has to be marketed and licensed as an alcoholic beverage. Unlike, say, the UK, where that threshold is 1%, and you can definitely buy true kefir. But what the products we have in our stores that are called kefir are made with, uh, you know, an, an approximation of kefir, a novel modern starter that was in some way derived from kefir, but it's not made in the traditional way of, of kefir, which is really distinctive kind of a culture. Well, I'll have to look for that. My husband is British. He's actually in England right now. So next time I go to the UK, I'm going to look for that. Or you can find really easily kefir grains and try making your own. You know, I need you to come to Boston because I feel like I need a class. It's always sort of like to start something new, you want someone to hold your hand a little bit. Any plans to come to Boston? It's funny. I was there less than a week ago. You're kidding. But Oh, oh no. <laughs> I missed you. <laughs> On my website, wildfermentation.com, I list all of my upcoming classes and presentations, and I do quite a bit of traveling. But, you know, luckily, because there's such a hunger for this information, there are a lot of other people who are sort of taking up this work and teaching about fermentation. And Boston has a great fermentation festival and lots of fermentation education going on. But really, in, in, in all parts of the U.S., I'm meeting more and more people who are doing this important work of demystifying fermentation for people. It's really cool. I mean, I'm even looking in your book at an oat porridge and you talk about fermenting the oats and that just, I guess, starts to kind of break them down and makes them easier to digest, right? Yeah, totally. And this isn't a new idea. You know, I really got this idea from like 18th century British cookbooks. But, you know, it's been very common traditional practice to ferment grains before you cook them. It makes them creamier. It makes them more flavorful. It makes them more easily digestible, you know, really superior in many different ways. And any grain can be fermented before you cook it. It's really just soaking it in water, you know, because a mature grain is dry it's got lots of yeast and bacteria on it, but they can't do anything because they're in a state of dormancy because they lack water. But as soon as you introduce water, you are reawakening these dormant organisms and they can begin doing their work. And you talk about, do you want people to coarsely grind up the oats or can you just take your old fashioned Quaker oats and add your liquid and give it some fermentation time on the counter? Yeah, you can just do it with, you know, your rolled oats, your your steel cut oats. I mean, I wouldn't use instant oats that have already been parboiled. I would definitely use something, you know, that's just a like a grain that has been milled. But yeah, any form of the grain, just soak it in water and it will awaken dormant bacteria and initiate a fermentation. I love it. Wild Fermentation, The Flavor, Nutrition, and Craft of Live Culture Foods. This book is amazing. It's a wealth of knowledge. I love the photos in here. So I'm going to be digging in. I think the first thing I am going to do is I am going to make my own sauerkraut. So I'm taking the plunge. I am doing this. Hey, Sandra, I love to ask my guests about their favorite cookbook. You know, what's the book on your shelf right now, other than your own book, that you're cooking from, that you love, that you love to recommend? Well, let's see. I mean, I tend to look in a lot of cookbooks, but you know, what can I say? I, I keep coming back to the joy of cooking. I mean, I love the classics. The joy of cooking taught me how to make sauerkraut in the first place. And, you know, often that is the first place that I look for recipes. Hmm, good to know. And what about um, the other question I love to ask people is, your favorite foodie or your favorite chef, somebody that you would love to meet that you've never met before? Trick question. No, it's not. I mean, I just follow that world so little. I'll say most of the chefs whose names I know, I know their names because I've met them. So, I mean, certainly there's lots of chefs who I've met who I admire. Courtney Burns is a San Francisco chef. I haven't been to her new restaurant, which is called Motzi, M-O-T-Z-E, but her old restaurant was Bar Tartine. And, you know, she and her partner, Nick Ballas, I mean, amazing food with such kind of inventive fermentation aspects to it that I really admire. Hmm, good to know. Bar Tartine. I love a tartine. So that sounds good to me. Well, Sandra, anything else you want to share with us before I let you off the hook? It sounds like you have a lot of things growing in your garden, so I'm sure you're itching to get back outside. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, but you know, really just my website, wildfermentation.com has information about my books, about my workshops, and also links to all kinds of other fermentation related resources that are out there on the World Wide Web. That sounds good. And I will say one thing, which I'm surprised I didn't ask you at the very top, and that is a lot of my listeners are parents of young kids. And have you ever done any workshops with younger kids, you know, who might be a little skeptical about eating sauerkraut, for example? Well, you know, I think that that's sort of an adult idea that kids would not like sauerkraut. I mean, sure, if you're going to spring it on them for the first time when they're eight years old, they might <laughs> resist it. What's but, that? You know, if you were feeding it to them all along when they were learning to eat, they would love the flavor. And I feel like I'm living testament to that. There was never a time when I didn't like sauerkraut or kimchi. I watched my nephew, who's 15, now teething on pickles. So, you know, I would say the key is to introduce it to kids young. That said, I will say that I've had great experiences doing fermentation workshops with kids, you know, especially real hands-on methods where you're getting involved with your fingers and it's very tactile. I've found that just in general, kids really, really go for that. And I've had such fun doing that with kids. I bet. Yep. Hands-on. They love it. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. And I do a cooking class with kids here in the Boston area, and I'm thinking we might have to start doing sauerkraut. So I'm going to start playing around with that. I cannot thank you enough for joining us today. I've wanted to have you on the show for, believe it or not, for several years. So I'm just so thrilled that you were able to join us today. Well, I'm so glad that it worked out. Thank you so much for having me. Well, that was a great show. You know, I heard Sandor speak years ago at a conference, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics Conference. So I'm so happy he joined me today. If you would like to learn more about the giveaway of Wild Fermentation or to get all of the resources and links to what we talked about on the show today, head on over to Liz's Healthy Table to my show notes and enter the giveaway and check out all those resources. And until next time, everybody, thank you for listening to Liz's Healthy Table. Oh, 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 oh,